from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And is everybody ready for the third annual Youth Poetry Slam? Yes! Yes! The inaugural slam in 2014 featured teen performers from around the district. And last year, we expanded the event to include teams from across the country. So this year, we are delighted to welcome three national teams to join DC's Youth Slam team on the stage. And, brace yourself, they are from Des Moines, Iowa, Run DSM. Yay! From Indianapolis, Indiana, Indy Pulse. And from New York City, Urban Word. Yay! Our host tonight will say more about the format of the Poetry Slam, but before I invite him up, I want to thank a number of organizations for collaborating with the Library of Congress on this wonderful event. First, the National Endowment for the Arts, our fellow federal arts agency that helps us bring poets and writers to this festival. Three cheers for the National Endowment. And Split This Rock, the literary organization that helps us reach out to our competing slam teams. I would especially like to thank NEA Literature Division Director Amy Stoles and Split This Rock Executive Director Sarah Browning for their efforts to bring America's best youth, youth slammers to this book festival. So tonight we have a terrific lineup of judges. Two of them are acclaimed writers who earlier in the day participated in the festival. The first is poet Joy Harjo and author Meg Medina. Thank you both for um, extending your time to be here today. And now fasten your seatbelt. I'm pleased to announce that our third judge for tonight is the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. So thank you, judges. So I'd now like to turn the mic over to tonight's host, Joseph Green, Split This Rock's Acting Youth Programs Coordinator. Joseph is also the co-founder and program director of Poetry Now, an after-school creative writing program for DC area students. And he has over 10 years experience as a professional spoken word artist and writer. So Joseph, it's all yours. Thank you. Good evening. How are you? Are you ready for a poetry slam? All right, so um, I'm going to give that like a D plus. No, I mean like you showed up to class. You didn't know what class you were in. And you didn't bring any utensils, all right? No pencil, no paper, nothing, all right? So we're going to try it again. But I'm gonna give, um, give you some things to think about this time. Um, this is a poetry slam. So when I ask you to applaud, I want you to applaud like the future of our country is gonna get on this stage and open themselves up and share with you the keys to how to make this world a better place, right? <laughs> that was just like one thing. That was just like one thing, but you, see, you seem to understand what I mean, right? So every time a poet comes on stage tonight, that's the sort of acclaim they should meet, all right? I say it like this to my other audiences. Imagine your firstborn child has just won a spelling bee in a language you did not know they could speak. That is amazing. And that's how we should treat every young person that comes on this stage tonight. So one more time for our wonderful performers. 
As you heard before, this event is brought to you by the Library of Congress, the National Endowment of the Arts, and Split This Rock. Please put a hand together for those amazing groups. And we have poets from all over the country, all right? So this time, I'm going to say the name of the team, and I want y'all to applaud like we just learned how we're going to applaud for the rest, all right? From Des Moines, Run DSM! From Indianapolis, Indy Pulse. From New York City, Urban Word. And from Washington, D.C., Split This Rocks, DCU Slam Team. So, to keep things fair, that will be the last time this evening until after the performance that you will hear the names of the participating groups because we don't want to have any home uh, team advantage. But please understand that these young people worked hard on these poems. They traveled from all over the country to be here to share these words with you. And that is a special thing. Now, show of hands, how many of you have ever been to a poetry slam before? Good, 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 good. So you know everything I'm about to say. This is for everybody else in the room. A Poetry Slam is a competition that was started in the mid-1980s by a construction worker in, New, uh, in Chicago named Mark Smith. So what? Exactly. Um, in this competition, people will compete with original pieces of poetry not going over three minutes. There will be no musical accompaniment, no props, uh, no costumes, anything of that sort. All right. These poems are original constructions of these young people, so I just want to really uh, drive that home that these are their thoughts, their words, their ideas about the world, um, and they are welcome welcoming to you after to come up and talk to them and ask them about these things. We hope that you take these ideas home and you discuss them. If this Poetry Slam is no more than clapping and scores, then we have failed here today. So please keep that in mind. Other things you need to know about the Poetry Slam is there will be judges. They will judge from zero to 10. 10, being the best poem you have ever heard. The roof falls out. Everybody ascends to heaven. That's it. It's over. That's a 10. Zero being the opposite of that. The bottom falls out, everyone goes to hell, it's over. No. Um, but they have, been, um, they have been prepped. They know that they are judging on performance and they are judging on content. Now, it's a hard job to judge, okay? So judges, I'm going to introduce you one more time and you're gonna get applause. This might be the last applause you hear tonight. Um, but you deserve it. You are experts in your craft and that's why we chose you, okay? All right, so again, poet, musician, and playwright, Joy Harjo. The Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. And YA author of Burn Baby Burn and Yaki Delgado Wants to Kick Your Ass, Meg Medina. Judges, do not be swayed by the audience, all right? We picked you on purpose. There's a reason why you're here, all right? Audience, sway the judges, all right? When they throw a score up and you do not like that score, we don't do booing anymore, we don't do that. We say, listen to the poem. Everyone say, listen to the poem. Exactly, and that's how they know how you feel. If they throw up a score that you, you love, you do what? <laughs> Woo! You applaud riotously, all right? It is a rough crowd. <laughs> it's a very rough crowd. That's okay. We have security for the judges afterwards. Um, no, this is about the poetry. We will clap for the scores, we will scream, uh, listen to the score if you don't like the score, but at the end of the day, the poetry is the point. I say again, the poetry is the point. These young people and their words are what matters the most. We just do this competition thing to get people out in the seats because this is America and we love a good competition, all right? But the fact of the matter is we are here to hear some poetry. If you're ready to hear some poetry, make some noise. You're not ready yet. So, it is a tradition at the Poetry Slam that we have a calibrating poet. We call them the sacrificial. They come, they spill their blood on the stage for you. Judges, 
They will be the litmus for all of your scores for here on out. If you like a poem more, give it a higher score. If you like a poem less, give it a lower score. All right. This poet is not in the competition, but they will be scored as if they are. Please, this is your first test. Coming to the stage, please put your hands together for Ushindi Performance Group member, Jonas Oraya. How y'all doing? This is loud. All right, cool. I'm gonna do a love poem, cause like, who doesn't like love poems, you know? Cool. If I was brave enough to be your Romeo, would you be my Juliet? Would you find me important enough to be in your poems? Would you bring me up in random conversation with people I've never met? Would you believe me when I tell you you are your own worst critic? See, everything you do is sunsets on countrysides, drops of rain dancing across a baby's forehead for the first time. You are nothing less than a treasure. I know that people have loved you for all the wrong reasons. If I was brave enough to show you the right ones, would you let me? I've, I've been thinking of how to tell you how I feel. Or if you would even believe me, see, you've met the worst parts of me before the best parts got a chance to shine. If I was brave enough to take the time, would you let me get to know you? Not just the picture perfect smile or face you put on for others. Would you let me know the reason you wear the mask? See, this isn't a crush or teenage lust, but I wouldn't feel comfortable calling it love because I don't just want to kiss and hug you or know all your secrets. You make me want to be the man I don't ever think I can be. Your words fuel my inspiration. My skin dances to the sound of your voice. When you speak, I don't get butterflies. I get riots of unspoken words, demanding refuge, raging balls of fire. In the midnight of my stomach, I wish the flames could dance off my tongue as easily as they do yours. You were the night before my revolution. I ask you. If I was brave enough to be your Romeo, would you be my Juliet? Or could we trash all the metaphors, get rid of the overused cliches and not so well done similes and simply help each other be the best versions of ourselves? <laughs> Couple of, thing, couple of important things I want to point out there. Um, some of our Poetry Slam veterans reminded me that I forgot to say something at the beginning. This is not a poetry reading. This is not a golfing event. Um, this is a poetry slam, all right? So if you hear something you like while it's happening, it is encouraged for you to reciprocate that energy back to the poet, all right? There's several ways you can do that. If you hear a poem, or if you hear a line in a poem that you really like, you can snap. Let me hear everybody snap. Yes. Sounds like the biggest bowl of Rice Krispies. <laughs> Second thing you do, if you hear something you like, you can say word. Everyone say word. word. All right, now this is my favorite thing in the world invented by a mean Drew Law. You can take the word she, you can take the word Jesus, and you smush it together. If you hear something that makes you feel holy on the inside, you say, Jesus. Everybody, on the count of three, let me hear your best Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus. There it is. All right. So from now on, the poets are prepared for this. You're not being rude. All right? They know this is coming. The snapping is preferred because it can keep going. But if something really, just give it to them. It's good. It's beautiful. All right? So judges, this is the longest amount of time you will ever have to put your scores together. All right? So this is the scoring part. Judges, may I see your scores in three? Two. Y'all was always supposed to have it written down already. Three, two, one. Scores up. From low to high, I have a 9.0, a 9.1, and a 9.5. Let's hear it for the poet, please. All right. And because this is the National Book Fair, um, there is a twist to this poetry slam. There's a theme, all right? So for the first round, the poets have to present a poem about books or reading, all right? That is a very broad theme and can be interpreted in many, many ways. I look forward to seeing how many ways they interpret it, okay? 
but that's the first round. The second round will be a poem of their choice. Now, do y'all want to hear the names of the people who are going to blow this stage up tonight? Make some noise. All right, this is also the order that will be going in in the first round. Please save your applause to the end so they can hear this. And remember, we have Alyssa Gaines, Chantelle Medina, Kasia, Kenya, Julio, Henry, Kaylin Vasquez, and Elandra Brazel. Put your hands together for the poets. Keep that energy going for the first poet and the first round, Alyssa Gaines! Where is my chariot? Where I've been waiting? I've been stuck here for so long. Nobody hears my cries, my cage song. He woke up this morning, got out of bed, got ready to chase the big blue and yellow exhaust pumping city dragon which took him to school. Little did he know he'd be fighting many battles that day. He'd be battling many monsters and even breaking a few rules. Jabril, our hero, rode the dragon until it stopped at a stop, then he got off and walked to the schoolhouse, 8.30. He was 30 minutes early, never neglecting to say, good morning, but sometimes forgetting to finish the homework of last night. At last the bell rung and he rushed to his place, sat in his seat and prepared for the monster he was about to face. This big ugly monster wanted to incarcerate him, the monster who never wanted to see him graduate. The monster who tried to hold him down, keep his head to the ground, and tell him his fate. Which the monster, statistic, made to seem set in stone. Our hero slayed the beasts of the classroom and their preconceived notions. He fought the rude things they said and the negative things they told him. He fought the idea that the naturally grown hair from his head was nappy and that was bad. He fought for the education he deserved to have. He fought the giant of not having all the tools that he needed. He fought the fiend of fighting to catch the dragon to get home. He fought the students who crossed him not knowing his struggles and fought punishments more than he deserved. And he fought most of these battles alone. And sometimes it got hard wielding swords of hope and smarts and that's why he needed the schoolhouse every day. He needed to learn how to craft things other kids got for their birthdays. Laptops, Wi-Fi, a school board mom and automatic good grades. Nobody saw in him the vision that he saw. Nobody thought that he would ever go far. Nobody thought his dreams would ever come true, but Jabril, I believe in you. You're paving your own yellow brick road, wielding your own weapons with your melanin and afro, fighting battles to help you succeed and keeping hope when it's hard to believe, or else you wouldn't chase the ever-moving dragon every day. Oh, Jabril, he knows, never does his work. He doesn't care of schoolwork at all, is what the monsters all say to try to throw him off. But hero, keep your head up. None of that is true. And if everyone thinks it is, I believe in you. You are worth so much time and so much patience. Jabril, you are worth a decent education. They see the habits you've developed to survive on the streets and try to take them at school. Beasts confiscate them at school as they try to teach you to, to fit in in a society that doesn't even want you to. But I believe in you. Stay firm in your beliefs. Participate, write, and read. And I know you recognize that the teaching tools are twisted, but do what you need to do in this education system. And once you finish school, you can help to fix it. And all the problems of our world, beautiful black boys and girls, you are all like the hero from our story today. No matter what anyone does or what anyone says, you hold so much potential and so much value. Black youth, I believe in you. best part of being a host is walking up during someone else's applaud and pretending like it's for you. Um, as a host, I am not allowed to talk about the poems as they go through, so you all have to make sure that when a poem comes up here that really moves you, you let that poet know. Judges, you have three, two, one, scores up from low to high. I have a...
A 9.5 and a 9.5. It's here for the poets. Coming up next, please put your hands together for Chantelli Mendina. All the way to the stage, folks. All the way to the stage. Don't give up. Don't give up. They say, if you want to hide something from my people, put it in the book. The best way they have hidden everything from us was by burning the ones we wrote. How dare you rewrite me into history as if I be fiction? Hand me a book that sanctions my slavery. Command of me to praise to a man that mirrors my conqueror. I cannot fall bended knee to a father. After mine was stripped from me like the dignity of my people, do you know how it feels? To take up 10 pages of an American history textbook yet make up more than one third of the population. It feel like misrepresentation. It feel like misogyny. It feel like misery. It feel like I am pretend fighting for a right to be a real in a world that want to see me erased. I can't. They won't erase me. Do you know what it feels like to have to go and pray to a God that doesn't look like you? Do you know what it feels like to not be able to rewind and track a tribe that belongs to you? Think back to a time where you felt incomplete, inadequate. Think back to a time where you felt like you were only half of something you thought you were holistically. Imagine being Hispanic, stuck in between black void and white privilege, stuck in between two bloodlines, one that calls island home, another that yearns to rape island of all that it is, hoping that you knew your skin, that you could pick a kin. Thank you. Judges, because we have to, in three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, I have an 8.9, a 9.0, and a 9.0. Can we hear one more time for the poet, please? It's not easy. Coming up here, opening yourself up, laying yourself down like that. Um, I have been in this work for about a decade and the courage of the young people that I see on a day-to-day -day basis having the nerve to do this inspire me endlessly. So for all the young people that have picked up a pen, that have stepped on this stage or will step on this stage, I need a lot more applause than that.
Coming up next, please keep that going for Kasia! It is twilight. Auntie daybreak long after the moon has been tucked away and the stars have left the sky. It is here in this eerie place Edward Cullen finds himself enthralled in the very thoughts of his love, Bella. He is compelled and moved by her. It is she that protects his hollow soul with the shield of ignorance. And ignorance are the borders of Indiana, the state that just won't say yes, the state who continues to press the LGBT community. I remember the feeling of being utterly dumbfounded by a fair maiden's appearance. Yes, I was physically attracted to her, but it was the blood coursing through her body and the heat that radiated from her chest that I knew there was something deeper. And so deep into the night, I thought about her. I also found myself dreaming in the day as thoughts of her lean, metallic-like features danced across my brain. My brain, having been stepped on by my governor, his proud hoops engraving state laws of restoration in my mind, telling me to think straight. And I knew it can never happen, and it can never be possible like Edward 107 and Bella 17, myself a junior and she a freshman, it was wrong. But it didn't change the fact that I wanted it to happen. But maybe I am more like Jacob, hot-headed, ill-tempered, and a bit jealous in my love, the new moon, unsure of personality, sexuality, a quarter of a moon shore, half of a moon shore, waxing full, waning, gone. It is new moon when Jacob goes to the faces. From slide, the slightest thing could turn him. Action, reaction. From wholesome human being on two feet to a ferocious beast on the prowl. Fire in his eyes, rage in his growl, and I'm no beast, but my eyes begin to glisten and nervous laughter occupies my vocal cords when I see her. The slightest thing could turn me. The gleam in her smile, the dazzle in her eyes that could replace the stars, or the sweet aroma of her presence that gets carried away with the wind. My love knows there's an opposing force out there, a force that is not for all rights, a force that will prey, hunt, and kill anyone not in alliance with the church and state. The world of twilight causes a newborn army. My world causes homophobic politics and corrupted saints. Both are newly changed, untrained vampires, bloodthirsty, power hungry, and will do anything for a code of normality. What is normal? What is freedom? What is love? It keeps hurting me a wooden dagger through my chest, which is Rifra. My Christianity cannot be healed by this wound. Where is my freedom? To love, to pray, to get down on my knees and confess to another woman that I am dangerously in love with her. I'm breaking so many rules here. She is the moon, I am the sun, and for a moment in time we are perfectly aligned. The gravitational pull of human emotion between us. And as we and as we separate, our eclipse fades and day begins to break. Breaking news. Indiana has just passed the religious res the religious reformation. Indiana has just passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, pressing same-sex and gender laws like tending to our cornfields, and this is what we're known for, like men who shapeshift into wolves and the undead stalking the sweet aroma of their next victim. But it's not always that easy. We don't always get to choose what it's like to love someone the Bible and the Constitution rejects, a sinner and a criminal. Like the moment a wolf imprints on another human being, fate has decided the love of your life. And fate is what brings worlds together, colliding them in space and time, drawing parallels between fantasy and reality. And this is reality. Are you the protagonist or the antagonist? Choose wisely. The future of our saga depends on it. The future of my saga depends on it. <laughs> Judges in three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, I have an 8.9, a 9.1, and a 9.2. Clap for the poet, please. So another important announcement that I neglected to make at the beginning is, um, hey, everybody, turn your cell phones off.
Term to stang, stun, anything that does not make noise. We do not want to hear your little Wayne ringtone in the middle of one of these poems. You know who I'm talking about, Sarah Browning. Um, no, but seriously, uh, turn them off, but use them with this hashtag. <laughs> National Book Fest. Yes, let people know that this room right now on a Saturday night is full of young people who like words, who love words, who are passionate about books and reading and can articulate that passion, all right? They don't know we're out here. We need to tell them. Use that hashtag, National Book Fest. All right, now, clear the room. It's time for our next poet. Please put your hands together. Start clapping right now for Kenya! It's time to go. All the way to the stage, please. There it is. It was on a Wednesday during my 11A class. Mm, sorry. It was on a Wednesday during my 11 a.m. chemistry class when a butterfly placed itself upon a student's desk. And I've never seen something so graceful, full of freedom, all nature and God wrapped into a seamless body. In chemistry, we are taught that the world is made of matter full of lively atoms that shoot their way across dimensions, break barriers like the butterfly. But today, he was not celebrated as such there. There'll be no projects made in his honor, never rejoiced in his colors, executed him to black and white. My professor called it the circle of life, necessary for science, like splitting mockingbirds open and claiming their voice boxes as rewards, but that was to kill, perch, any unwarranted reason to remove a soul they claim it to be swift, Easy, who cares, it's just one less of them premeditated, one to see it in full flight, to know if open hand and small man will become covalent bonds, never seem to think twice, just react, like Adams, like justice system, like every black man slander to the court bench, like every family with lost father, like Tom Robinson, like Atticus. They are not the body at the gun range, just noise cancellations. Our lives just be open statement using casual conversation, something to sigh about them back to lecture. They would never know how it feels to be a mockingbird or a butterfly or every time convicted of a crime they never even thought to commit, pushed into the rifles dim. They play Russian roulette with intent to kill, murder, displace this right life, whatever, whether it be by bullet or jail cell. 1933 or 2016, we are always remembered by how easily black can turn to crimson. It was on a Wednesday during my 11 a.m. chemistry class when a butterfly placed itself upon a student's desk. And for a moment, I knew that it came as a warning. Thank you. Audience, you're doing a good job. Judges, you're doing a great job. Three, two, one, scores up from low to high, I have. A 9.3, a 9.5, and a 9.8. Clap for the poet. Keep that energy going for your next poet in the first round, Julio. In 2016, 12 teachers were murdered for fighting for educational reform in Oaxaca, Mexico. I 
I've never been to Oaxaca, but I hold the soil with two palms like a newborn child. My mother was born there. Heard the sun was as warm to melt your heart into a rib cage. Heard the soil carries the sound of three million souls walking to school. Education isn't close to home here. The difference between a book and a child is that sometimes they're seven miles apart from each other and most commonly the teachers know the students better than the parents do and maybe sometimes the teachers will substitute for the students when the parents are sick, when the parents are on opposite sides of the wall, when the parents are, are breathing less or when they're breathless. Oaxaca teachers crease open the floors with seeds, sprout every child they can from sinking. So why do they only get acknowledgement when 12 of them wind up dead on the news, still arrested with their eyes still open, didn't even get a chance to blink, but saw the world spin off its axis? This is what happens when you speak on a country's problems. How crazy it can be for the Mexican government to bite off their own fruit. Why doesn't anybody ever talk about how good the students are? What are the students doing? What are, what are the students doing? What's proficient nowadays? Ask how many miles they walked to school and calculate that with the amount of times they came hungry. Ask, ask how things are going at home. But don't be surprised when they ask you what that last word means. Ask, ask them who their favorite hero is. And they'll reply dead, 12 of them to be exact, 12 teachers that advocated, all 12 made national TV. You could still read the names on the screen when the TV turned off, still hear the screens of 12 generations fighting, but you probably couldn't. Sound is always hard to hear behind a wall, always misinterpreted, always looked over. How do you kill 12 teachers and not learn from it this will be the first time a teacher is absent in the classroom, the first time the students are actually listening, the first time 12 teachers raised their hand at the exact same time and all got the same answer. Aren't you tired of watching? Or did you even bother to watch at all? Judges, scores in three, two, one, scores up from low to high. I have a 9.5 a 9.8 in the first 10 of the evening. We got one, two, three more poets left in the first round. Please keep that energy up. Start clapping right now for your next poet, Henry! All the way to the stage. My parents don't know about storytelling. Another word for it is gossip in their minds. To spill the secrets out of our household for everyone to know. They forget about the tales they've been told about witches and the thieves in the city. Their tongues are now stale. They do not speak a native language. They has never been this cordial. It is all something they've memorized, a nauseous script. My parents know argument. They know bland dialect that will split them, a half that won't be quiet, a half that won't forgive. Then their conversations become wearisome. They're eerie. Sometimes my father talks about his dad, how he saw his own friend drown. How we then walked home to get sleep for work the next morning. My parents had to cross rivers in order to get to school. They take their clothes off, they hold them up high. 
There's nothing celestial about that. At school, they are only given disciplinary bruises. You can't blame the teachers. Beatings are all my parents afford. The nearest library is two hours away. They're not great at reading. They know numbers. They know how to part their lips. My parents don't know many ways to say thank you. They'll nod their head. Yes, they'll send money back to El Salvador. Sometimes they'll just look at you and stay silent. I told my parents I wanted to be a writer. My parents do not know that they are stubborn. My parents do not know that they do not like what has risk, what isn't stable, what is out of the norm. They remind me that we were never people who did things out of willingness, that we only know demand and conformity. They remind me that we have only opened newspapers to look for coupons, that no one reads anymore, that no one cares anymore. My parents do not know rebirth through writing. Death is given logic when it is written. My parents came to this country rather young. They do not know traveling. They know migration. They know starving. They have suffered because they have come to meet them in the face but they have never, never spoken about it. They live hurt, yet they have never read something of healing. And this is the way I carry when I write. And this is what I'll continue to carry until everything is said, until my parents understand. Fortunately, my parents know something about listening. <laughs> Judges, scores in three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, I have a 9.4, a 9.5, and a 9.8. Let's hear it for the poet. Keep that applause going for your second to last poet in the first round, Kaylin Vasquez. After Fortress of Solitude by Jonathan Lethem. Dear Gentrifier, when you and the rest of the hipsters want to crowd the M train and act like y'all know Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the older Latino people in the subway car look at me like I'm one of you because tattoos and piercings are white, been appropriated so long ago we almost forgot it was never your culture to begin with. I got off the train with a bunch of you too who checked the newly placed public maps to find a restaurant, a bar, whatever else you colonized here. Gallivant through like y'all even know how to get to the street this place was named after. You can't, can you? Can't tell me which small business shut down to make room for the Dwayne Reed, the Whole Foods. Tell me you love Spanish food. Bodega coffee. Hit up the empanada truck every night to educate your taste buds. Forget your presence prices out the ones cooking for you. Tell me you respect culture, and that's why you go to Afropunk every year. Tell me you're for equality and pay $4 for a cup of yogurt willingly, like my sister's food stamps ain't got limits, like it care about my nephew's stomach. Tell me when you make a new geo filter on Snapchat, just like y'all did for Washington Heights. Oops, wahi. Because you're all for renaming New York. Been a while since the Dutch did it, so I guess it's time for something new. Tell me you're against a new neighborhood and pay two million for an apartment on the water. Name the landmarks you were too drunk to notice. Tell me about the Domino Sugar Factory. Before it was condos. Like black history wasn't always just a speed bump for developers. Like it ain't American history, unless it's yours. Tell me you can build an entire home out of suffering and broken spines. Like slavery was never abolished after all. Tell me about Puerto Rico. 
That island you noticed when you were sailing over here? Tell me how easy it is to find a cheap plot of land there. How the sun on your skin makes you feel like you belong because my home ain't safe, ain't sacred no matter where it is. And tell me, you know all of this. And if you can, I still know it is only because you are used to taking things. Poems, so many poems, and so many scores. Judges, three, two, one, get them up. From low to high, I have a 9.0, a 9.3, and a 9.4. Let's hear it for the poet. And coming up last in our first round, please put your hands together, start clapping right now, for Elandra Brazzo! to the stage. One, two, three, no, 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 two, four, six, one, two, three, you want me to read it? The second paragraph? All of it? No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. I have a pretty, I mean, I mean, problem with reading. Growing up with dyslexia, you spend more time trying to read your name than write it. Trying to find the rhythm in words over alphabets. How he's turning to he's are just not understanding the difference. I love going to birthday parties. You find out quickly how your misunderstanding of words can turn a room silent, can turn reading class instructions into a teaching lesson over the difference between A's and I's. One sentence feels like a deaf sentence. Reading out loud is like a deaf sentence. I can feel my cheeks turn red. Arms go cold, hands tremble. I've spent 30 seconds telling you how I feel, but if I wrote it down, I would stumble first grade. I can read, I mean, I can read, I mean, I can read, I swear I can. Words just run for me, second, third. Third is when I became a mathematician. Counting the number of people that read before me didn't feel like a math problem, but more like a destination. Fourth, fifth, Mr. and Mrs. Brazel, Elandra struggles more than most kids. Sixth, we can help by putting her into some classes. Seventh, eighth, hi, I'll be your literacy teacher today. Does she know that words run for me? Does she know that I run from words? Ninth, I learned that boys don't leave me tongue-tied. Words do, I do, I do, I know the word. It's on the tip of my tongue, you notice you can only use this phrase so many times before they stop believing you. Do you even believe in me anymore? I mean me, I mean you, I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, you know what I meant? Forgetting placement in books, run on sentences, A's turning to I's, is an abnormal behavior, it's a silent hand raised, it's a kid choosing to act out because you refuse to read through them. How do you help someone with dyslexia? You let them tell you their story instead of you forcing them to. One, two, three. Read one. Judges, what do you think? Three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, I have a 9.7, a 9.8, and a 9.8. Clap up for the poet. So that's the end of the first round. Y'all did real good. Very proud of you. Only heard like one random cell phone tone go off. Don't do that again. <laughs> but real quick, before we jump into this last round, we're going to take all the poets, we're going to turn it back around again, we're going to go right back down the list, we're going to take two scores, we're going to add them together, and that's how we're going to find out who's going to win our poetry slam. Um, but real quick, everyone just look around the room. Just take a look around the room. I said this earlier, but it's practically standing room only on a Saturday night for a poetry slam. That's a beautiful thing. Now keep clapping while we take a picture. I can do this.
Everybody, Nas say National Book Bus Road. Uh, do it for the gram. Hi, y'all. All right, here we go. In this order, Elandra, Kaylin, Henry, Julio, Kenya, Kasia, Chantelli, and Alyssa. Those are your poets in the second round. Make some noise for them all right now. Coming right back to the stage, please put your hands together for Elandra Brazzo! I just want to be pretty. Not mama secondhand compliments type pretty, but drop dead gorgeous. Not have to look at my reflection and regret it. Have a list of 10 things in my head that I should have fixed, but ignore them because only pretty people stare in the mirror for longer than 10 seconds. My breasts are getting heavier. I try to experiment with different bras, but they always seem to want to be the center of attention. My stomach hangs as low as my faith. My weight is why my faith in God is questionable. I wonder why they call them love handles if they're unlovable. It seems like my hips aren't getting the hints that my stretch marks are trying to give them. They just keep on expanding. I eat like I'm going to find my rebus's apology letter at the bottom of the bag just to find my guilt staring back at me. I can't stare in the mirror for too long. I begin to remember what I never do. That's why I get dressed with the lights off my stretch marks. Remind me of why I started cutting in the first place. I mean, I mean, why I went on a diet in the first place. Maybe that's why they call them marks, because being overweight always leaves a scar. I wonder when my sister told me I was gaining a few pounds, did she know I was gaining insecurities too? I've been tucking in my insecurities since I was 12. Just to picture me in a crop top makes me argue to crop myself out. I avoid doctor appointments because I know they'll weigh me. My gym teacher doesn't know that I'm dishonest about my weight on tests, that the only time I run is past scales. I wonder when God sees me, does he throw open his mouth? I do what make him regret creating mirrors in the first place. I've never felt so exposed in my life. I'm standing in front of glass and I'm the one about to break. With a bare body and raw emotions, I've let you validate me. You keep my secrets hidden in your cracks, have no shame, and putting gaps in my confidence. You and I can't agree on what I should look like. You let me pour out my flaws just to show them off. Made my own reflection turn on me. Turned my body into a homicide. Make me lose my mind first instead of pounds. You made my neck, back, breast, chin, thighs, arms, hands, lips, stomach into a suicide letter. And 5 a.m. cries for help. I can't hide anymore. I can't hide my way under long sleeves and cardigans. Let God shine on all of my flaws. Expose my wounds and worship in them. Would it be cliche if I told you I'm taking all of me back? Maybe you'll never see beauty in me. Never think that my body is worthy of framing, but I don't need you anymore because I am drop dead beautiful. Judges, scores in three, two, one, scores up. From low to high, I have a 9.8, a 9.9, .9, and a 10. <laughs> Keep that same energy going for the next poet. Please put your hands together for Kaylin Vasquez. Mama taught me three things. It is the man's job to build a woman into the spine of a bridge. It is the woman's job not to bleed through the cement in the process. God is always watching as this unfolds. When my boyfriend says I am stupid, grows furious with me because I do not want to have sex with him, makes me feel insignificant and shames me for it. I feel him melt me down 
and spread me over the steel overlays. Smooth me into a roadway accordion, how sweet the sobbing sounds when harmonizing with his blaring engine. I rate and hot like the sting of the first time he snapped at me, God enters. As how I just stand there and let him drive me down to a skid mark stops, says I must get it from my mother. The way we turn fists into palms full of love notes. How we be the food he devours on the table and the table he screws on afterwards. Absorb a man's darkness and still lead him to a flame he can choose to blow out. At whim, he kisses my back with his feet. Stomps across each vertebrae as if I could connect all his broken and I saw it coming. And the way he'd scoff at my magic as if he were Houdini and I were a backyard act. The way he made requests into law, decree, a rewriting of the Bible that I knew would only end in apocalypse. Fooled myself into a fairy tale that played out in the wrong order. Now here I am. A nymph for a storyteller that won't remember my name by the end of it, but will remember my breasts. The fertile mound of my stomach, how women bleed sustenance. Don't you know our blood is the binding agent in cement mix? God clears her throat. As how I plan to save myself now that my limbs are encased in rock, says, do you remember when you were wild? And I don't. This hug of concrete done declawed me. Done polished me down to token, I stand in the worst fashion, unmoving, bones degrading like my name in his mouth. God asks, remember that time you loved yourself? And I claw a crack through the asphalt, hoping my voice can escape. But by the time the words inch up the metal beams, there is no one there to receive them. God is gone now. And I do not know if she was there the whole time to begin with, or if it was only my yearning to see myself near divinity. But I know she's always watching. For the day I snapped the suspender cables, split my deck and let the steel concave itself into a skull fracturing casket, let him cascade down, still screaming for the womb of my love, God and I will laugh. It will be the last time I let a man make a highway of me. And that part, I taught my own damn self. Judges, three, two, one, scores up from low to high. Why are you writing so slow? From low to high, I have a 9.5. I have a 9.6 and a 9.7. Let's hear it for the poet. Keep that energy going, coming back to the stage. Henry! I come from a family of repent. My mother fell in love. My father was a cigarette addict. I was wrapped in that same evangelical blanket. I grew up learning how to get comfortable to sleep on pews. I grew up learning how to close my eyes and have conversation. I grew up learning how to not get stomped on by those who danced in time of praise. No church boy dares to think of God unworthy. I was probably one of the only little boys that paid attention. I had this trust and fear in God. It was this being that could turn our church, a school cafeteria, into a sanctuary. We borrowed music stands from classrooms, used them as pulpits. When I was eight, I finally stood behind one. I preached in front of other eight-year-olds and the pastor's youngest son. I delved into the stout book of Revelation. I spoke about the rapture, horns blowing, a blood moon. I became a holy infant at church. I learned to walk, I became a priest. My father had me memorize this verse. I don't remember it completely now. It was about a believer who rebelled, about a dog that returns to its own vomit. Shortly after the understanding of God comes the absorption of what baptism is. I began to take baptism classes. Most of the people there are in their 40s. 
we have read the same book, we know that baptism is not a toy. It is a seal embossed onto your spiritual and physical being. That it is not a toy. It is not guaranteed for it to be a good thing to be baptized at an early age. Jesus was baptized when he was 30. I was baptized a couple weeks before I turned 12. Our congregation was going to be uniting at another church. We did not own our own baptismal pools. I remember getting my white robe. The man who tied it had very unstable hands there. Tremble mirrored the great crumble of Sodom and Gomorrah. That evening, I bathed in God's waters. They were welcoming, but lukewarm. I had this conversation the day before with my mother. It still lingers with me. She mentioned how young I was and the greater repercussions of sin that came with it. I was just an eager boy. Judges, let me see those scores. And three, two, one, scores up from low to high. I have a. Let's hear it for the poet. If you're having a good time, say yeah. yeah. If you're having a real good time, say oh yeah. oh yeah. Coming up next to the stage, please keep that energy going for Julio. A letter to mi abuela, I love you. Even if you hate that I say it in English sometimes, it still carries the rich rivers of tamarindo and mango juice, your favorite. I know you, Grandma. I know English is foreign on your tongue the same way it is to your ears, but I promise it will find its way to your heart through the creases of your smile. Let it soak in. Your teeth shine like you ate diamonds for breakfast. Your cheeks are the color of caramel syrup on pancakes. Carousels cover the color of your eyes, and I could surf on the cursive of your hair. You are the surface of the sun. So beautiful and so bright, the world needs to notice you more. Nobody ever appreciates how gorgeous the sun is until it's gone. I acknowledge your struggle, Grandma. I know raising six kids in a room wasn't your fault. Single mothers go through thorns and flames but you made it out just fine. I know your palms still ache from holding the ceiling in place from my mother, my aunts, my uncles. You are the strongest woman I know. You cradled all six of your children on your smile. Even if you knew there'd be no food that night, love becomes a five course meal, you need to stay alive. And I feel your pain, Grandma. I know having people taking advantage of you because of what you can't comprehend is cruel, it's ignorance. They only love Spanish culture when it's not affecting them. This is not a poem about me though, but when my grandma tells me, what is the point of learning English? If I'll be gone before I can say I love you back, it feels like I failed her, like I disappoint her. It hurts to see my grandma struggle with words, like language is another barrier she has to sneak past. Her mouth has been bordered up like empty homes. My grandma is an empty home, lonely. But she stands bold with no support. I feel your hardships, Grandma. The ocean tried to swallow you. You had some hardships, Grandma. Your name will never sink in these waters. I tied a rope to every syllable of your name just in case it falls under pressure. And I am still above water. Every vein in your body connects to your heart like all bridges lead to kingdoms. I love seeing my mother happy because I can see my grandmother smile as well like a two-for-one deal. I'm all about finding the value in love because my grandmother knew struggle way before she knew joy. She knew rape before sex, almost like she knew scars before scabs. She broke the ocean in half to get here. She is the strongest woman I know. Dear Grandma, 
Truth is, I wrote this poem for you years ago. And every family dinners, every barbecues, every Sunday mornings, I'm learning to appreciate the littlest things with you because you helped me grow. Once more, gracias, abuela. Judges, three, two, one, scores up from low to high. I have a 9.8, a 9.8, and a 10. Keep that energy going. Coming up next, put your hands or keep your hands going for Kenya. All the way to the stage. binge watch Netflix like a child looking for candy in church, religiously. And my favorite show has always been on this new black. Tells jail from the feminine side, saw us off little white woman who doesn't think she deserves to be incarcerated, has a life too good for the system. I think I fell in love with the fairy tale aspect, like all jails with formatories, where lifelong friends are made and the food isn't the best. Call a summer camp for criminals. But the sun always sets on someone else's horizon, turns from crime fiction to reality, more like a speck of our reality, shows police brutality as a paper cut, just another one of our issues to profit off, treat us as a trend, something for the audience to eat up until they're ready to vow another meal to our stories to write before their tongue spit us out. And it burns to see your own crucified, pinned down, left breathless, then have the nerve to say that you can't breathe, do even weak and black skin is turned into bragging rights, or do you think of a new plot for your next season of the way to increase your, your fan base of the black body swiped under the flag? Be careful, you might reveal the millions of messes your people have made. Why does no one want to own up to? I mean, clean up the messes they've made. I know I've heard the story before. Too many times I made a thought we're living these moments, but we always forget to read the preface of the novel. No one wants to know the beginning of the horror film. This storyline has become too relatable. Just acts of victims of inner city education or down south voting boosts this country. This is classified too many of us as villains while indicting the suicide squads to claim to protect these streets here. They delete the foreword, just skip to the appendix. You become as transparent as the Constitution's copyright, whether in Ferguson or Lynchfield. We are always the, cliff, the cliffhanger. We are never the last one standing, but the first ones on our feet. Too many of our spines have been sacrificed just to keep this story together, just to bind severed mouths to our wrists. We always end up cleaning the bloodstains anyway. Never knew this was white carpet. Seems to make sense now. How we always knew what occurred and wearing at the generations of scrubbing motives. Only things that never come out, but you call us the animal. Place us in cages and tell us to be civilized, forced to choke on your keys. While you proceed to close the gates, release that menace and smile into the camera. Laugh at our gas for life or freedom as the scene fades into our bodies with fear still upon our faces. Spoiler alert, we're prosecuted for claiming this last breath to ever be ours. Why is it that we're never able to attend our own curtain calls? Judges, scores in three, two, one. Scores up from low to high. <laughs> Y'all making such a mess. Um, we have a 9.5, a 9.5, and a 9.6. Let's hear it for the poets. As you may imagine, it is not an easy thing putting on an event of this size. And I don't mean just this slam. I mean like this entire book fair. Um, and it could not have been done without the help of a bunch of volunteers. So I want y'all to look around the room and you see the people in these blue shirts back there. I want y'all to give them a really loud round of applause.
And then, for making this place as accessible as possible, our interpreters here, I would like to give them a round of applause also. Coming up next to the stage, please put your hands together for Tasia! I'm right? Am I accurate? Is it happening? Oh, there she is. I was born in Anderson, Indiana. My mother, a native to the town. Engine failed to ignite. My galaxy was closing in on me. A town where there's either a church, cornfield, or liquor store on every corner. Houston, we have a problem. My future seems distant. I'm tethered to my ship, but everything seems so far out of reach. My mother knows everybody who's anybody because of her body. She's hard to miss. Loud mouth, crumbled skin, and thick flesh adorn her bones. Access denied. Something's missing. Where's my co-pilot? Who should have been my father was merely a faded shadow in my faded memory. A far out satellite circling my world. Abort mission. I can't, my memory can't retain. ADHD gets in my way. An asteroid at close range. Which switch do I use? The first time I heard the words behavioral disorder, I was in the second grade. And I wish this only be the second time I felt like an outsider. Outside of this orbit, outside of the classrooms I sat until I could refine my act. I stayed, I stayed hidden, out of sight, out of mind. I stayed hidden away from the gleam they called a bright future. My family always taught me education was key. Go to school, get your degree, my grandfather would say to me, my poppy. Average built, mentally sound, gray hair lining his mahogany skin. He's the strongest man I know and black don't crack, but I've seen his brain matter explode like black matter by the fact that he lacks an education prior to the 21st century. By the sixth grade, I was a 21st century scholar, which meant I could attend any college in the state of Indiana and it would be paid for. This was the first time my mother found faith in the system. Her heart thundered and her eyes pixeled when she realized I could wear a white collar as a black woman in corporate America. System override. This isn't supposed to happen. They're paying my dues because my mother has everything to lose. She falls below the poverty line. So she sent me on this mission alone. So I tried to defy gravity as they often did my teachers. It lost star out of its orbit like a rocket propelling into the Earth's atmosphere of education. I need to know how far I've come. Show me a demonstration of the progress I'm making. I was always told to reach for the stars and I never gave up yet. I was always let down check levels. My capsule's going off course. I've been directed to a new galaxy. The galaxy of Rhonda, my aunt's big, busted personality as wide as the journey to the center of the earth, a laugh that rings through outer space, bringing people in. She is my new galaxy. I can stop reaching for the stars because she has put them among me. Her only request is that I choose one that shines as bright as I do so I don't become a falling ball of dust that once embellished the sky. I've chosen the sun. The creations of this world, the particle of our galaxy, all made up as we know it, but this isn't the Big Bang Theory. This is the phenomena of my life. Engine rebooted. I am burning through the solar system of education. My brain like jet fuel, my thoughts the presence of planets, rare and majestic. Everything I am is made up of tiny stars and ideas as grand as this universe. I, me and my son, have, me and my star have become one. My bones and flesh are wrapped in string that tie me to the planet to let me gaze among the stars. This theory has been proven. Mission complete. Strong young people. Judges. Scores, please, in three, two, one. Scores up. From low to high, I have a 9.5, a 9.7, and a 9.7. Let's hear it for the poet, please. Two more competitors left in this amazing slam. If you're having a good time, make some noise. Oh, it feels good. Coming up next, please put your hands together for Chantelli Mendina. All the way to the stage, folks, all the way to the stage.
Today I wear a blue dress two sizes too large. I don't want to force anyone to froth at the mouth or rampage uncontrollably. My blue dress tames my curse so I walk unabashed. Yet man is taught to speak things into existence. Yo, sexy, my temple is brought forth, readies itself for demolition. Man gawks at me, uses his eye to enter the body. I've tried my best to hide. Man calls me ma, and now I am his mother. Forced to feel like I should discipline him, demand some respect. Man yells, baby, and now I'm an infant. God tells me I should yell, scream, cry, make it clear that what he's calling me isn't my name. Apparently, I don't live here. This ain't my private property. I'm free to the public for viewing. Man says, sheesh, girl, smile. He wants me to take his oppression for appreciation. Man has the nerve to stare at me up and down. Hard and steadfast, waiting for some kind of gratitude to be thanked for trespassing, waits for a smile, some indication that this is what we both want. I am barely restraining the bullet burning to be roared out of me. My eyes are unrelenting black pebbles. I can't swallow this man's audacity. His patience silence questions if it's really rejection or just the front before the yes. Pauses to see if I really don't want to share myself with him. Man smooches as if to call lost pet. But I will no longer allow his words to domesticate me. The morphing stops now. I speak myself into existence. I am only what I say I am when I walk down the street. I am not your mother, your baby, your girl. My ultimate form is dragon. Every time you belittle me with your words, your eyes, my jaw widens, teeth sharpen. I thirst for blood. This is a warning to all the men who take my blue dress as an invitation to my body. Who don't let me pass them without yelling sexy, miss beautiful, miss best with a fat ass. Ma, baby girl. I am a woman and a beast. Still want to see me smile? Still want what's under my dress? Oh. Judges, may I please hear your scores in three, two, one. From low to high, I have a 9.9 .9 and two tens. All right, all right, all right. Calm down, but not really, because we have one more poet left, all right? Keep that energy going. Start clapping right now for your last poet, Alyssa Gaines. I went to my friend named September's 13th birthday party in rural Indiana, where I had to convince her to take her Confederate flag down so that I could come. I still went to the party, but the damage was done. The reason I was so hurt was because still in our country, innocent blacks are being slain by police, and people have the nerve to display a flag of prejudiced racial history. She wondered why I was so upset. July 13th, 2013, George Zimmerman found not guilty. Where was she when the verdict was in when six non-black women said Zimmerman was innocent? I was in Florida when they picked the jurors. My mama's house, when they gave the verdict, I remember in my journal I wrote how they just gave him his gun like, we're sorry, sir, you're free to go. And it hurts that my mother must tell my eight-year-old brother the way to behave if he ever gets pulled over. It's like what you don't hear in the police shooting recordings. The one thing they're missing, the warning. Be compliant. Keep your hands in the sky and explain the situation. Drop your weapon. But the weapon I can't drop is the reason I'm a target. It's because I'm black, woke, and politically conscious. No justice, no peace. No racist police, no killing innocent blacks and leaving their bodies in the streets. Hashtag Black Lives Matter, because police are not treating us like all lives do. When I say Black Lives Matter, how could that offend Blue? How, after everything we've been through, it's rude? How is it socially unacceptable to fear for my little brother's life? How if I dread the day he learns how to drive and I voice that it's impolite? 
because black people are being persecuted by police who receive paid leave. And if you really believed that all lives mattered, why don't you stand with black ones in our time of need? When people talk about breast cancer, would you say all cancers matter? So why are people mad is the operative word black and oh the irony, it's funny almost. People say blue lives matter when all jobs do and their defense is they never said that all jobs don't. See we say things like black lives matter every day and nobody combats it because black isn't what we say and legality is only a technicality when it comes to police brutality. What if September, your dad or your little brother or your uncle was at risk. Would you stay peaceful? Would you stay quiet? Would you enjoy being told how to handle it? No, I'm upset because I'm tired of hearing the officers have not been charged or they were acquitted when there was so much evidence they could have admitted. And the one shooting that made me particularly mad was Charles Kinsey. He was laying hands up on his back. It showed no matter how much my mother teaches my brother MJ, even if he does what the officers say, even if all the talking he does is to explain, even if he's protecting a man with autism. All lives can't matter until black lives do and I won't quit until every September realizes that it's for these innocent people whose killers not punished, whose bodies scattered, that I'm here with my fist tied proclaiming black lives matter. Judges, let me hear those scores in three, two, one. From low to high, I have three tens. So I've done my part. I've kept my mouth shut. I've said nothing in between these poems the entire night. The hardest job in the room is to keep silent when all of this truth is being spilt out into this space. If you were moved tonight, if you heard something that inspired you tonight, please make some noise for these eight poets that came on this stage. You shouldn't be sitting. You shouldn't be sitting. That's for y'all. Good job. Doesn't seem to be enough. All right. We still have to do some math. We want to award. Um, we have some books and some gift certificates and some things we want to give to the people. So we're doing some math real quick while that math is happening. Uh, this event was brought to you by the Library of Congress, the National Endowment of the Arts, and by Split This Rock. And right now, I would like to bring to the stage the executive director of Split This Rock to tell you about all the amazing work we have going on there right now. Please put your hands together for Sarah Browning. I'll take a hug. <laughs> Joseph Green, everyone. My incredible colleague. Split This Rock is a national organization based here in DC. We cultivate, teach, and celebrate poetry that bears witness to injustice and provokes change. I think you've heard some of that tonight. Our youth programs are throughout the Washington, D.C. area. The young people you've heard from D.C., from Indianapolis, from Des Moines, from New York City, they are the future of poetry. They are the future of literature. They are the future of our country. Is your hope restored? Is your hope restored in the future of our country? These are our leaders. These are our leaders to come. Who all's here from the D.C. area? All right, we got D.C. in the house, we got Virginia in the house, we got Maryland in the house, make some noise. And Joseph is ready. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. May I have all the poets that test the stage? All the poets, the all these brilliant young people.
Come join me. Come join me. So, Sarah, will you let them know what the prizes are real quick? All right? Sure will. So we have the most beautiful, most recent book by one of our finest poets and the judge tonight, Joy Harjo, Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings for the top three winners. Yes, and Joy will sign them to you personally. And then the uh, number one poet, the one who got those numbers, yeah, the highest <laughs> scores, will also get um, a $50 gift certificate to Politics and Prose Independent Bookstore here in Washington, D.C., but you can order online from the bookstore. You can order online. All right. All right. In third place with a 58.2, please put your hands together for Alyssa Gaines. <laughs> from Indianapolis, Indy Pulse. In second place, Julio from Run DSM Des Moines. How you doing? You feeling good? I got some good news for you. Um, I really like your poems. I think you did a really good job tonight. Um, I liked everybody's poems. Y'all all did like a really good job tonight. I was super impressed. Super impressed. However, because we have to add together the numbers in first place from Des Moines, please put your hands together for Elandra Brazzer. Zerl. Brazil. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get that right. I'm gonna get that right. Can I everyone be quiet real quick? Everyone calm down. I, 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 I did so good all night. I did so good all night. I had the name spelled out phonetically on my paper. I was feeling so good. I want the winner to have their name said correctly. Can you please tell these people how to say your name? Elandra Brazel. Please clap for her. <laughs> on behalf of the Library of Congress, on behalf of the National Endowment of the Arts, on behalf of Split This Rock, my name is Joseph Green. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so very much for coming. Please support the arts. Have a wonderful night. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.